Universal Center for Renovation, where the Word is made flesh, presents Historical and Biblical Israelites. This is strictly for educational purposes and commentary, a biblical and secular historical literature. So enjoy. The Indians and Ethiopians of Ancient Palestine, Part 7. Woolly Hair, Southern Kingdom, and Straight Hair, Northern Kingdom, Israelites. The Ethiopians and Indians of Greek Literature. The image on the left is a depiction of a member of the Southern Kingdom from the Lachish Reliefs. The Lachish reliefs are a set of Assyrian palace reliefs narrating the story of the Assyrian victory over the Kingdom of Judah, the Southern Kingdom, during the Siege of Lachish in 701 BCE. Carved between 700 and 681 BCE as a decoration of the Southwest Palace of Sennacherib in Nineveh, in modern-day Iraq. The relief is today in the British Museum in London. Sennacherib's conquest of Judean cities without the capital, Jerusalem, are mentioned in the Bible, the Book of Kings, Book of Chronicles, and in the Book of Isaiah. The image on the right is a depiction of a prostrated King Jehu of the northern kingdom of Israel from the black obelisk of Shalmaneser the third the black obelisk of Shalmaneser the third is a black limestone neo-assyrian sculpture with many scenes in bas relief and inscriptions It comes from Nimrud, ancient Kalhu, in northern Iraq, and commemorates the deeds of King Shalmaneser III, Rin, 858 to 824 BC. It is on display at the British Museum in London, and several other museums have cast replicas. King Jehu was the tenth king of the northern kingdom of Israel since Jeroboam the first noted for exterminating the house of Ahab or the house of Omri according to the obelisk Jehu severed his alliances with Phoenicia and Judah and became subject or tributary to Assyria the black obelisk of Shalmaneser the third shows King Jehu and his delegation The painting, or fresco, in the middle, is from a 2,000-year synagogue located not too far from the Orontes River. It represents Moses and 12 princes from the 12 tribes of Israel. It was painted by descendants of biblical Israelites. The two figures on the left and the right typifies the physical types that would be easily identified physically as an Indian type and an Ethiopian type. While we certainly understand that the families in the nation of Israel were more physically diversified than these two men, it's just to highlight that ancient Israel transcended what today might be called biological race as categorized in contemporary society based on biblical historiography and descent 
People with different complexions and hair types can be and are completely related because they share a common forefather or ancestor. In this case, it would be a man named Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. The ancient Israelites were not only divided by region, but in the eyes of ancient literature by an Indian type and an Ethiopian type. The tribes intermarried, so this multiplied the different physical types. The variety was compared to the different colors of soil and to a bird with many colors. Israel also married with their neighbors. This part of the world, like the world at large, was a melting pot of human types. Although Israel physically differed, they were related by a common ancestor. What nation is a better representation of humanity than a nation that physically represents all different types under the sun? This cancels out racism by the plain fact that your brother doesn't have to look like you. The ancient Assyrians' bas reliefs remain a show of the diversity of Israel. These monuments can be seen in museums around the world. Judah, woolly haired, and Ephraim, straight haired. Of course, there are always exceptions to the rule, but you get the general idea. Judah applies to the southern kingdom of Judah. The southern kingdom consisted of tribes or extended families of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. They generally had a so-called Negro phenotype, though their phenotype was also universal. And Judah was scattered into all nations, so these people, after 2,000 plus years of exile, will look like every nation in the world Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, Hawaiian, Samoan, Pakistani, Arab, Iranian, East Indian, Russian, Central Asian, European, African. The list is too long to name everyone. Ephraim applies to the northern kingdom of Israel. The tribes or extended families of the northern kingdom consisted of Ephraim, Reuben, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulon, Manasseh, Asher, Gad, Naphtali, and Dan. They generally had an Indian phenotype, though their phenotype was universal. Ephraim also represents the lost tribes that were separated from the rest of the world's commerce, business, and trading for thousands of years, away from mankind, and eventually reunited with the old world during the age of European discovery, the so-called Indians of the Americas. Today, they are called Hispanics and Latinos, as well as Indians of North America and Canada. The diversity of Latin America speaks for itself.
Study finds Christopher Columbus was a Sephardic Jew from Western Europe. Researchers analyze DNA fragmented remains, believed to be world shaping explorers. They say any further narrowing down of his origins remains elusive. The Times of Israel. Though this idea makes some uncomfortable and is controversial, if you delete this fact out of history, it distorts the true story. Christopher Columbus wrote a book, and he named it the Book of Prophecies. He deliberately looked for the lost tribes of Israel because he believed in prophecy. He considered that the discovery of the lost tribes would herald the end of the Gentile world, a time of war, strife, plagues, and disasters. The twelve tribes would be reunited, the Messiah would come back and bring peace and love to humanity forever. Madrid, Rooters the 15th century explorer Christopher Columbus was a Sephardic Jew from Western Europe, Spanish scientists said on Saturday, after using DNA analysis to tackle a centuries-old mystery. Several countries have argued over the origins and the final burial place of the divisive figure who led Spanish-funded expeditions from the 1490s onward, opening the way for the European conquest of the Americas. Columbus wanted to be the one that sparked a change. All he had to do was locate the lost tribes of Israel. This act would initiate the last days. He studied biblical and secular literature, including the Greek classics, with the help of men like Marco Polo, who also sought out the lost sheep of the House of Israel. It was finally narrowed down to the Western Hemisphere. They searched all of Europe, Asia, and Africa, and only found the remnants of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi in that part of the world. Columbus knew the Northern Kingdom's land was called the Black Indies and in India in the Greek classical literature. So he would look for the Indies in the West, the West Indies. In the medieval mind, there were three Indies, the ancient India of the land of Israel, the East Indies, land of the Hindi, India, and the final India, the people of the first India located in the land of Israel. But these people migrated to the third India located in the West, West India, the location of the Lost Tribes, whose discovery would bring the end of days. Columbus believed prophecy, and he wanted to hasten the time. Columbus knew the earth was round. He knew about the Western Hemisphere. Before the Byzantine Empire fell to the armies of the Ottoman Turks, maps and charts 
were kept in the Eastern Roman Empire archives. Byzantines spoke Greek and were well aware of the Greek classics that were only available to the Latin-speaking Western Romans when the Greek scholars fled to the West, escaping the slavery of the Ottoman Turks in 1453. Crates of Malice Crates of Malice, 2nd century BC, was a Greek grammarian and Stoic philosopher leader of the literary school and head of the library of Pergamum. He was described as the Crates from Malice, to distinguish him from other philosophers by the same name. His chief work was a critical and exegetical commentary on Homer. He is also famous for constructing the earliest known globe of the earth. The name Perioici roughly means those dwelling around, nearby, deriving from peri, around, and oikos, dwelling, house. Pedoici, the Americas, 2nd century B.C. Pedoici, or the Western Hemisphere, is in the Red Circle, the Americas. On the globe of crates of malice, you can plainly pinpoint Europe, Asia, and Africa, named Ecunomy. Perioici, the Western Hemisphere. Perioici, Greek for the Americas. In the Old World, we can see the location of Spain. Spain was the location that the prophet Jonah sought to flee to from the port of Joppa in the land of Israel. King Solomon had a port for maritime trade located in ancient Spain around 1000 BCE. His navy sailed to the Americas every three years for the resources that were plentiful at the time in the Americas. The Western Mediterranean is called a Phoenician lake in ancient texts. The Neo-Phoenician Maritime Confederacy was headed by Israelites. As a result, at different times throughout history, Israel were called Phoenicians by Greek writers. So fully assimilated were the ancient Israelites with the Phoenician people and culture. All Christopher Columbus had to do was retrace the navy of King Solomon to the land of Ophir, where King Solomon's maritime expeditions found much gold. Columbus believed Ophir was Hispaniola, modern-day Haiti and Dominican Republic, while other people of that day thought it was Peru. Solomon's navy sailed through the Pillars of Hercules, the Straits of Gibraltar, to West Africa, the Americas, also to Britannia, or England, and back to the land of Israel. Christopher Columbus discovered the trade winds while traveling to the Canary Islands and used these winds to sail west to the Caribbean Sea or the West Indies. The notion of the lost tribes of Israel being finally found has been suppressed for centuries. But we can read the literature of men that believe this would launch a new world order 
that would finally bring peace to a war-weary humanity. More to come.